since the legacy of humanity's decline was inherited by the embrace of falsehood, the reversal of our fall will come with pure and perfect doctrine. Edenically, Satan told Eve that Christ was not right, that he had selfish motives for denying to her the forbidden fruit. Eve, by her indulgence of that doctrine, partook. And Adam fell to show dominion and strength, and likewise faltered. I mean no profanity when I say, like a loaded down ass, this yielded to us our age-old burden. No question about it. The strapping of his figurative cult to Satan's poisonous ivy was a surrender of the kingdom. The question to be answered by this study is how shall we win again Adam's honor? Unto whom can we strap this burdensome a legacy? Our study today, number 47, four, this January 15th, 2022, Happy New Year's, by the way, is entitled Adamic Election Restoration. The fight against falsehood continues forward these 6,000 years as we advance toward the, quote, perfect man, close quote, so as to secure victory. Be it ever so clear. Today, the struggle is not with finances, not with social acceptance, nor politics, etc. It is with the crafty and cunning slights of false doctrine upon which we are deceived to believe. Hence, the victory needed to choose the good and refuse the evil the very burden inherited from the first couple shall one man, the perfect man, courageously rise to feed us. Mustard seed Adventists, this is our work. We can begin our study by saying that frustratingly, even the word perfection has eluded us. Thus, the first step is to discern God's meaning. Christ said, quote, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasures in heaven, and come and follow me. Matthew chapter 19, verse 21. Perfection, consequently, is to succeed where Adam fell. We must latch our burdens to Christ. How can we follow him if only one man knows his identity? All others teach against Bible prophecy. They fail to recognize that Christ, according to Deuteronomy 18 and many other scriptures, was the dove who descended upon Jesus and spoke through him. Instead, they teach that he is Jesus himself. Beyond that, they also confuse him to be the father. Only one man was destined to know Christ's name, his identity. That man who was scheduled to know is the son of David, Christ's very own elect. He said, and I quote from Luke chapter 10, All things are delivered to me of my father. And no man knoweth who the son is but the father and who the Father is but the Son, and He. Here go we see, someone else is brought into the picture, somebody other than Christ and the Father, says, and He. And He to whom the Son, Christ, will reveal. Luke chapter 10, verse 22. Good thing that the Father sent the Comforter to remind us of the Lord's words. Such obviously leads to Bible-defined perfection. And to achieve it, 
we must find the man, Jacob, the thief. For the Lord also said in Matthew 24, Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, get this, even good men don't know. But know this, if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, did you catch it? The good man of the house, he didn't know. If he would have known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. Matthew chapter 24, verse 42 and verse 45 through 47. Somebody missed the keystone lesson. Was it you? Did you note that the thief, he who delivers good doctrine, as indicated by the fact that he feeds meat in due season, for we're talking, as we stated from our introduction, we're talking about the reversal of falsehood by doctrine. He who feeds meat in due season is given the Adamic dominion. He is made ruler over the entire earth, over all that Christ hath. He's referred to as a thief. This cites to us his chosen, Jacob, the supplanter. Through him, the elect of God is to reveal the fullness of Christ. Isaac promised as much to Jacob. He said, God give thee of the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth, which we've determined to be oil and plenty of corn and wine. Let people serve thee, and nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren. Genesis chapter 27, verses 28 through 29. In other words, Jacob was to have nations even his own brethren bow down to him. Such has yet to occur. Therefore, who is the antitypical Jacob the thief? The one whom the disciples were commissioned to be on the lookout for, to watch for. Maybe you think it should be a Barack Obama or Donald Trump or Benjamin Netanyahu or maybe you're a you're a member of the mob and you believe it should be Al Capone or some other individual. Shan't you dash your chosen and accept Christ elect? Has the likeness of God at least yielded to you that much gravity? Who is Jacob anyhow? He is the proverbial son. S-U-N. No, we're not confusing with the Bible. It's through his posterity that the Bible was yielded to the world so that we could be enlightened. Remembering this will aid you in your trek to wisdom. Only this thief can dash the cunning craftiness of deception spoken of by Paul. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 15, and note what he says. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Why? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith. We're still looking there for, for that day, aren't we? 
till we all come in the unity of the faith. There's a lot of disunity in Christendom, but it's not an epic that is beyond the divine plan for humanity. He gave these gifts to the church till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. There it goes. There's that word perfection. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lay wait to deceive. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 15. I hope you were able to count the different personalities that were there to uh, orchestrate the path of growth. You have the ministerial session began by the apostles, carried on by the prophets, and by the evangelists, by the pastors and teachers. These were given for the perfecting of the saints. Then you have the perfect man who brings unity by revealing to us the fullness of the doctrine of Christ. But then you have another group of people, the, those who, by cunning craftiness, seek to seize away from you your pearl of great price. He, the perfect man, the elect of God, he who follows Christ, not the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers at all, he achieves what has never been accomplished in these 6,000 years of human history. He achieves world unity in Christ by his enlightenment. We could go to the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 42, and garner more information. It says, verse 1, Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness and will hold thy hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles. Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 and 6. People you hear say were no longer under the covenant. The Lord was growing the church so that he could give them a covenant. And this covenant was to be the light for the Gentiles. A light, therefore, to the Gentiles was to blossom. But first, this elect of God begins by restoring Israel. He is the actual man to whom the promise of Jacob pointed. Conclusively, then, he is the thief for whom Jesus commanded to the disciples to watch. We are told as much in Isaiah 49, verse 5, as he gives us more insight into this path of perfection. I begin by reading, And now said the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant. Pausing there for just a second. Formed from the womb. What in the world does that mean? Stay tuned as we proceed in the study that you may grasp its total meaning. And now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob again to him. Pausing again. Note, thus do we call him Jacob. He returns him to Christ. Though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord. And my God shall be my strength. Oh, I can't uh, help but interrupt myself on this. It says, glorious and with Christ as his strength. I ask, 
Can anyone become more perfect? Yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob, ergo the 144,000, and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. Aha! Remember this. He, antitypical Jacob, gathers the people. He brings to us our unity. We find this in Isaiah 49, verses 5 through 7. We must now discern. How did Jacob's posterity become displaced? So that the elect of God shall now reunite them to him. This is the central, albeit missing, story. They fell into a satanic deception. Thus, as did Adam, they, Israel, lost their rightful estate. I tell you, deception by cunning craftiness is the world's tragic severance from salvation. David gives us more insight as he described Israel's fall in Psalms 106. They did not destroy the nations concerning whom the Lord commanded them, but were mingled among the heathen and learned their works, and they served their idols, which were a snare unto them. Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters. Can you envision that? They sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils and shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and of their daughters, whom they sacrificed unto the idols of Canaan. And the land was polluted with blood. Thus were they defiled with their own works. Therefore, the Lord abhorred his own inheritance. Psalms chapter 106, verses 34 through 40. Now you see Paul's point of cunning craftiness that lies in wait to seize Adam's children. But the glory is in their restoration. In the ordination of Israel, beginning with 144,000. Only the elect can define their regeneration. Somebody is going to be able to discern the day of perfection. Somebody is going to be able to foresee how Jacob is going to be restored. And we're told that the elect of God is going to be given this commission. I'm citing from Ellen G. White. Christ said that there will be those in the church who will present fables and suppositions when God has given grand, elevating, ennobling truths which should ever be kept in the treasure house of the mind. It is not his plan that his people shall present something which they have to suppose which is not taught in the word. It is not his will that they shall get into controversy over questions which will not help them spiritually, such as who is to compose the 144,000. This, those who are the elect of God, will in a short time know without question. Ellen G. White, one selected message is page 174. Before we can examine more about their restoration or their restitution, perhaps we should take a look at their destitution. We saw how they caused the Lord to abhor his inheritance. And as a result, he used America, the English-speaking empire, coded in symbolic prophecy to bring them to their knees. Christ banished Israel 
under the Assyrian yoke, which he calls his locust army. To save humanity, God, in military parlance, chose to deploy another people that he calls his own, Gentiles, for his grand service, his special forces. They were to put the iron chisel to Jacob's face until, like Mount Rushmore, a subset of Israel, the 144,000, we know this without a doubt now, shall be exalted in grandeur. After all, Israel lost their protector from Christ when they abandoned their covenant. And by the law of Moses, Christ forged them in his furnace of affliction. Only in this way can the elect of God learn to refuse the evil and choose the good. Adam's chosen path to salvation. Assyria becomes that special force. Isaiah 10 best expresses this, his new dimension to revival and reformation. And I quote to you from verse 5. O Assyria, the rod of mine anger, and the staff in their hand is mine indignation. I will send him against an hypocritical nation. And against the people of my wrath will I give him a charge. In other words, Christ sends them the English-speaking empire against Israel. Why? To take the spoil and to take the prey and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. Howbeit he, the Assyrian, meaneth not so, neither doth his heart think so, Wherefore, when the Lord hath performed his whole work, he's doing a work on his people. When he has performed his whole work upon Mount Zion, which is his elected Gentile church, the Seventh-day Adventist church, and on another group of people, on Jerusalem, also known as the 144,000. Wherefore, when the Lord hath performed his whole work upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, I will punish the fruit of the stout heart of the king of Assyria. Isaiah chapter 10, verses 5 through 7 and verse 12. Assyria, who are they? Carefully examine the map. The literal and historic nation of Assyria, not to be confused with the nation of Syria, a different set of people, they, Assyria, are the people of whom we call the Kurds of northern Iraq. They were once, 2,700 years ago, a powerful and ruling nation, and they invaded and totally dispersed ten tribe Israel among the nations. Notice, they are north of Israel. A people read about the North Country and they think it's talking about Russia. But we find here in Scripture that it's referring to the nation of Assyria. These Kurds now occupy the lands of Turkey, the lands of ancient Syria, the lands of northern Iraq, and Iran. And they are still a vexation to those their neighbors. But they are north of Israel. And the Bible deploys them to be the code word for the end time and last power to afflict his people. Just as ancient Jacob is deployed to symbolize his end time descendant, the thief of Matthew 24, also prophetic Assyria here in Isaiah chapter 10 and elsewhere is the English speaking empire, specifically America the very Gentile power who was given the charge to reach deep into Africa to seize and enslave not all of Israel, but a portion of the Hebrews that we refer to as Jerusalem. The Lord's hypocritical nation. 
Thus does Jesus say in Matthew chapter 23, he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen gathereth their chickens under her wings and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. That's, that's why as I say that Jerusalem merely represents a subset of Israel. They who represented their children, the constituency who sent them, one of every family to represent their territories under the authority of the king in the ancient city. They are desolated and afflicted by the hypocritical nation. That nation represents the beast, also known as the locust, whom Christ at Calvary freed from the bottomless pit. We can examine Revelation chapter 9 to get a cursory look at the evidence for that claim. But lest you should be shocked in this, understand that if Israel, having been freed from the pit, could falter, what makes you think that his uh, special forces that ascended out of the bottomless pit could not herself become a beast. In fact, I refer you again to Revelation chapter 9, verse 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. That star represents Christ. He tells you that the Father sent him. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power. As scorpions of the earth have a power. I think this is a new rendering of what we see in Revelation chapter 9 because it shows you the empowerment of the Lord's locust army. That's found in Revelation chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. For greater explicity and detail, see the book of remembrance, which is entitled Seven Trumpet Luminescence. Of a certainty, then, the Lord used coded language, as he often so did, to purvey the full meaning, not just of Jacob and many of his, other, of his other prophecies, but of the United States of America. He refers to them as Assyria. Indeed, they send throughout the globe a myriad, more so than any other nation. You will not find this with China, with Russia, with Israel, with, uh, with Peru, with Brazil, with any other nation. He sends a, per, a plethora of prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers so that they may perform their locust duty and evangelize the world. And they do so with great uh, scorpion uh, power. They have been proven that America is the prefigurative northern army sent to dissolve Israel. More can be said. The reference of Joel 2 points to them when it says in verse 12, Therefore also now, thus saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart. Ah, the Lord shows his tenderness. At the end of the day, he's compelling his people to turn. And in verse 20, he says, I will remove far off from you the northern army. Therefore, it doesn't mean it's not a matter of protest in the streets. It's not a matter of taking up arms. It's a matter of solidifying yourself in the gospel and saying, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Turn ye even to me with all your heart 
and I will remove far off from you the northern army. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Be glad, then, ye children of Zion. That's a direct reference to those who grew up out of the Seventh-day Adventist church. So mustard seed Adventists, have you put on your glad faces yet? Be glad, then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately. That's why Paul mentioned all of the teachers and the uh, ministers that would be given through the 2,000 years of Gentile Christology. It was giving the former rain moderately. And he will cause to come down for you the rain. The former rain and the latter rain in the first month. Ergo, I quote Paul in his work, as well as the Old Testament and New Testament. Verse 24, And the floors shall be full of wheat. And good news now, we have a sustenance to make our bread. And the floors shall be full of wheat. And the fats, remember the fat that was promised to Jacob, and I said it means the oil? And the fats, shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, my great army which I sent among you. Joel chapter 2, verse 12, verse 20, verse 23 through the 25. It is this theme, the dissolution and then the restitution of Israel, to which Micah 5 makes reference. And I begin by quoting verse 1. And now gather thyself in troops. O daughter of troops, he hath laid a siege against us. This is speaking of the house of Judah, not ten tribe Israel. He hath laid siege against us. They shall smite the judge of Israel. That's a reference to Christ. And they shall smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. Emblemized, by the way, as Moses smiting the rock with his rod. And they shall smite the judge of Israel with the rod upon the cheek. But thou Bethlehem Ephratah. That's a nickname, a code word, as you were. I told you the Lord likes to speak in code word so that his elect can make it plain. But thou Bethlehem Ephratah. Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel. Bethlehem Ephrathah is of the house of Judah. Not all of the house of Judah can boast themselves as being skillful theologically, as being the people that can be the enlighteners. In fact, many of them through their history have devolved into those who use slight and cunning craftiness that lie wait to deceive. Truth has got to be told, this is the judgment hour. But thou Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel. Not everybody in Israel can rule. Only the seed that descends from Bethlehem, Ephratah, whose going forth had been from old, uh, from everlasting. I tell you, God put this plan into being. He had it already on the back burner before Adam fell. Therefore will he give them up, that's all of Israel, until the time that she which travaileth hath brought forth. Aha, he brings into vogue his locust army, the Christian church that he has forged and developed these past 2,000 years. She's to bring forth the manservant. Christ gives them up. They can no longer assert that they are latched to or attached to theological acuity. The Lord is waiting for one singular individual, Bethlehem Ephrata, the seed that grows out of the root of Jesse. And until he blossoms, the Lord says, therefore will he give them up until the time 
that she which travaileth hath brought forth. Then the remnant of his brethren, that's the mustard seed. Looking forward to your commission? I told you to be glad. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel, and he shall stand and feed in the strength of the Lord and the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. Just as Luke uh, chapter 10 foretold, he knows the identity of Christ. He's the one to whom the Son is to reveal. And he shall stand and feed in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall abide, for now shall he be great unto the ends of the earth. But what about our dispersion from the land? Verse 5 answers this issue. And this man shall be the peace when the Assyrian shall come into our land. Micah chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. No peace until the descendant of Jesse, also known as Bethlehem Ephratah, emerges. Expect more refinement on this theme than to follow. For now we see here that God leaves Israel after Judah smites Christ with the rod upon the cheek. Quote, he gives them up, close quote, but not forever, only until the Christian church gives birth to the son of David, the man-child. You know, the Lord said, let us make man in our own image. So why do we refer to him as the man-child? Give me a second to turn and refer you to John chapter 16, verse 20 and 21. Verily, verily, I say unto you, talking to the disciples. Ergo, he's talking to us because we're to anticipate the reiteration of these things in the last day by the Comforter. Verily, verily, I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. Ergo, we are commissioned to be glad. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow, because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. Now we have greater understanding and a higher rendering of what we heard in Genesis when the Father suggested to Christ and the Holy Spirit, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. I don't know if the Comforter or if Christ understood, but Father knew from the beginning of time, that it was this hour when the man would be born into the world that would bring to fruition this blessing. The son of David is that man-child. How so, you ask? He is the perfect man defined by Paul in Ephesians chapter 4. To recite to you again, the church will receive admonition from the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the, of the fullness of Christ that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Thus we see that this son of David, also known as the perfect man, also known as the blossom seed uh, from the root of Jesse. He is to remove the doctrinal confusion by conveying the perfect knowledge and doctrine 
of Christ. For perfection is to follow Christ. This is our wheat converted to our bread. That which brings uh, to an end the cunning craftiness by the slight of men. He, the thief, the perfect man, closes the years of Jerusalem's estrangement. He ends the period of Israel's darkness, defined for her both in Joel and in Revelation's trumpet. You may recall Revelation 8. It says, verse 12, And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten. Uh Uh-huh. And now we know it's a third part of the S-U-N, of Jacob, the one who orchestrated to us through his posterity the prophets, the priests, the kings. He is the one that yielded to us the word of God. It says the third part of the sun was smitten and the third part of the moon and the third part of the stars as the third part of them was darkened and the day shone not for a third part of it and the night likewise. Revelation in chapter 8, verse 12. The meaning and greater clarity is conveyed in the book Seven Trumpet Luminescence. But we can see that it makes manifest that Israel was to go through a period of a darkened estrangement from Christ. They were to be given up. They were no longer a force that could yield light, knowledge, wisdom, and understanding to the earth. It is therefore a matter of undeniable certainty that this man who feeds in the strength of the Lord, defined for us in Micah chapter 5, and the perfect man of Paul's depiction is the elect of God, the very one to be made ruler over all that Christ hath. To feed the world pure doctrine as his meat in due season. He stands and reverses the years of Israel's curse, whom the fourth trumpet calls the quote, darken stars of heaven, close quote. He begins by defining the stars of God, the 144,000, and does so without any confusion. Just as E.G. White promised, and as Isaiah 42 and Isaiah 49 affirm, the elect of God shall know without a doubt. A key concept must be cited now so that you may gain a fuller understanding. Let me give to you a word, latency. Latent means present and capable of emerging or developing, but not now visible. Miriam Webster. We go back to Adam's fall from grace. He was created in the likeness and the image of God. And beyond that, he was given dominion over everything that moveth upon the face of the earth. Did Satan defeat God in his purpose? By stealing away through cunning craftiness and through slight, this blessing? No, because the Lord said, blessed is he who feeds and meat in due season. Pronouncing that blessing to be passed forward to our day uh, to the thief. Therefore, the blessing was made genetically latent in Adam's posterity. Genesis chapter 5, verse 3 and 4 gives us an illustration, for it tells us, And Adam was 130 years of age, and he begot a son after his own likeness, after his image. And he called his name Seth. And the days of Adam after he had begotten Seth were 800 years. And he begot sons and daughters. The Bible is clearly manifesting to you the latency of the gift of God, the image and the likeness of God and man. 
it was vested not in all of Adam's sons, but in Seth. And it was re-articulated to Abraham. He was the one that was to bless the nations. And Abraham passed it onward, bypassing all of his sons, invested it in his son Isaac. Now, when I say passed it onward, it's a genetic heritage. I'm not so sure that Abraham knew exactly the genetic coding that he was passing onward. But Isaac passed it forward to Jacob, and a miracle occurred with Jacob. Ergo, he's a champion of the scriptures. He's defined as the S-U-N, the son, because he brought forth the stars of heaven. He passed it to his fourth son, Judah, and it transcended to our day vertically through uh, Bethlehem Ephrata. But he likewise vested the gift into his firstborn, Reuben, and then a second Simeon, then Levi. Again, I said he passed it vertically down through Judah, bypassing Issachar and Zebulon and Dan and Joseph and Benjamin and Naphtali and Gad and Asher. Oh, to appreciate this point, we have an excellent illustration. Think of a football team. Except for this football team had 12 players. Which one is going to lead the team? That's the quarterback. That's the vestiger that was passed through Judah. Though the entire team causes the community in the stadium to rejoice in uproarious celebration with their victory. This was God's plan for the 144,000, and this is why they're designated as the stars of God, the stars of heaven. Judah did not vest it in all of his sons. Judah had a sexual liaison, some may say illicit, with a Canaanite woman. And he brought forth his fifth son, Perez, we don't have full cognizance of the contribution of females to this message, but Perez passed it downward through Hezron, and Hezron through Rom, and Rom through Aminadab, and Aminadab through Nashon. As we pointed out in prior studies, Nashon is a key demarcation in the passage of the star, because when they blossomed, out of Egypt, he was the leader of the house of Judah. And Moses was commissioned to number all of the sons of the children of Israel. When he numbered the house of Judah, there were 74,000. But not everyone could exalt themselves in praise and saying, we are the lights of Israel. We are the elect of God. Let us discern for you your doctrine. Let us uh, initiate you into our lodge so we can lead you through 33 degrees of uh, transference so that you can likewise become angelic. They did not have that commission. None of the 74,000 men, to be more specific, over the age of 20, fit to go to war, had that capacity. It was only vested in Nashon. And Nashon passed it downward to Selma, and Selma to Boaz, and then Boaz to Obed. You remember some of these names, don't you? And Obed to Bethlehem, Ephrata, uh, to uh, Jesse. And Jesse, we're told in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1 through 4, there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. Now picture as you were, look at the image on your screen, an image of a worn out, aged, ragged tree. Those who know a little bit about forestry know that trees not only grow from the roots up, but they grow from the trunk down as well. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch, a branch shall grow out of his roots. Well, that's talking about Jesus. No, Jesus tells you as he ends the Bible in the book of Revelation, chapter 22, the last book of the Bible, I am the root and offspring of David. He didn't say he was the branch, the bright and morning star. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. So this 
root is a separation from the house of Israel and from the above ground stump. It's the Christian arm of Judaism. Ergo, Paul mentioned the apostles, the prophets, and the evangelists. These are the people that advocated first being of Jewish orientation, the advocacy of the Christian faith. Now, what is the designation that was latent in Adam and passed generationally down to Bethlehem Ephrathah? Isaiah 11, as we continue to quote, will cite to you exactly what that efficacy was. It says, referring to the branch, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. That's how you defeat Satan's slight and his cunning craftiness. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And shall be made of quick understanding in the spirit of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, nor reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. He's a Seventh-day Adventist Davidian, a rod believer who is fluent in rod theology. And he comes forward with his exceptional understanding as it advanced in mustard seed theology. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. Therefore, Jesse inherited this latent and quiescent seed that was distributed throughout the seam of Judah's lineage. But he didn't pass it onward to all his sons. You would think that his eight sons, all of them would be able to boast that they have wisdom, knowledge, and understanding and might. But he bypassed Eliab, his first. And he bypassed Abinadab and Shema and Nathaniel and Radai and Ozan and transferred it down miraculously to his eighth son, David. I say miraculously because, again, David was born from an illicit relationship. A careful search of the book of Psalms shows you that he was born of a Canaanite woman. And as a result, through his mom and his dad, we hopefully will be able to define the contribution of both. But it has taken all these years for both men and women to contribute to this Y chromosome as it transisted all the way down to the mustard seed kingdom of today. But we know that there was something special with David because the seed blossomed out of quiescence. It was no longer latent because David himself became a ruler in Israel. He ruled all 12 tribes. And this affords to us an understanding of the promise that is cited to us in Psalms chapter 89, verses 3 and 4. And 22 through 35, the Lord making mention of the fact that he was not going to ordain upon David eternal rulership. It would be upon his end time son. He says, I have made a covenant with my chosen, a sworn unto David my servant. Thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. The enemy shall not exact upon him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. And I will beat down his foes before his face and plague them that hate him. But my faithfulness and mercy shall be with him, and in my name shall his horn be exalted. Remember, Paul told you about we're going to be elevated by the name of the Lord, by the knowledge of the fullness of Christ. The horn is the empowerment of the beast. And in my name shall his horn be exalted. More about his power. I will set his hand also in the sea. And his right hand in the rivers gives you clues. The left hand of man, because the seas are mightier, more difficult to control 
in the rivers. His right hand is put in the rivers. His left hand, therefore, is put in the sea. I will set his hand also in the sea, and his right hand in the rivers. He shall cry unto me, Thou art my Father, my God, the rock of my uh, salvation. Also, I will make him my firstborn higher than the kings of the earth. I wish we had more time to discuss this. But we see from a careful search of scriptures, especially Psalm, that Christ has isolated him to himself part of the royalty of all the families of God from every kindred, tongue, and nation, and peoples over the last 6,000 years implanted them in what David calls in the Psalms his secret pavilion. And these are the ones that Christ was going to use to teach, to honor the son of David, making David's seed the firstborn. This is why the Bible says, bring you all the tithe, not into my house. Bring you all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. He wants the mustard seed Adventists to enlighten the Enochians, we call them, so that they could be subservient to the house of David. Thus does he say, I will also make him my firstborn higher than the kings of the earth. His seed also, listen to this mustard seed, his seed also will I make to endure forever, and his throne is the days of heaven. If his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then will I visit their transgressions with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faith once to fail. Once I have sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David, his seed shall endure forever in his throne as the sun before me. Now David received this promise from the Lord that in the end day, his throne would be established forever and his descendant son, perhaps a thousand generations, I don't think from David, perhaps from Adam, this seed would come to full blossom and to full fruition. It's vested, I say, in the house of Judah. You may not like the Jews, and you may have good reason not to like the Jews, but can you find one that you like? Can you find the one who's honored a father to win inheritance over the earth? Let me tell you something about this servant of Judah. He has his clothes washed in grape juice. It should be forcefully reaffirmed that Israel's years of burning under the Assyrian yoke was due to their very historic loss of doctrine that came by their worship of the devil. It was a transference of their faith. How dare they, in 33rd degree Masonic fashion, sacrifice Jacob's innocent seed, their very own sons and daughters, with the baseless and false hope that in so doing, they would spiritually ascend their children to heaven. Such, no doubt, was the result of being drunken by the old wine, not the false theology, but that which led to be susceptible to the slight and the cunning craftiness that doused them with error and deception. It was the result of being drunken by old wine. The Old Testament teachings. What does the Bible mean when it says a drunken? This means that they were without equilibrium and thus made careless in their deportment. They took for granted God's mercy. They were cozied in their national peace and global security, whereby they presumed that their sustenance, Jacob's blessed oil, corn, and wine, was an eternal innate grant, a given, a grace attributable, not because the Lord had lifted them from slavery to world preeminence, but because of their inherited supremacy. Remind you of someone else, the king of Assyria, doesn't it? Today, when you see their lowest state in America's streets, such 
After all, is there mourning in sackcloth? M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. In sackcloth, know for certainty that you are witnessing their desolation by the other servants of Christ, his Gentile locust army, his special forces. Thus does Joel 1 look back to their apostasy and tell us in verse 4, that which the palmer worm hath left, hath the locust eaten. Awake ye drunkards, and weep and howl all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up upon my land, strong and without number. He hath laid my vine waste, Lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. Oh, how appropriate. The Lord was going to bring them to the days when they had security in the kingdom by their house band. Lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. The field is wasted. The land mourneth. For the corn is wasted. The new wine is dried up. The oil languishes. Be ye ashamed, O ye husbandmen. How, O ye vine dressers, for the wheat and for the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished. Joel chapter 1, verse 4 through 11. Christ adds to our meaning when he, in Matthew chapter 9, said of this very new wine, verse 15. Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? When Christ walked with his disciples, this was his reason why they didn't have to exert upon themselves arduous fast. Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the day will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them. And then shall they fast. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles. Parlaying our attention back to what we just read in Joel chapter 1. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles, but they put new wine into new bottles, and both are preserved. Again, Matthew chapter 9, verse 15 through 17. Here, he makes reference to Shiloh's work. The very elect, the microscopic quarterback of Judah and all Israel. He who shall now sprout in the last day to bring to us the righteousness of Christ, the grape juice stained wedding garment. Genesis chapter 49 gives us the ultimate definition of the final end of the stars of heaven, of Israel's posterity. In fact, it's quite befitting that Jacob, the man himself, gave the pronouncement as we make allusion to Genesis chapter 49, verse 1. And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Well, Jacob, how is it you're going to know what's going to befall your children in the last days? Well, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Listen to my corn, my oil, and my wine. Gather yourselves together and hear, ye sons of Jacob, and hearken unto Israel your father. Genesis chapter 49, verse 1 and 2. Jacob makes it resounding and clear. He is pronouncing the work of the team play, and the personage of each of his 12 sons. It is helpful to understand that he is speaking of the 144,000 defined in the book of Revelation, the very topic that the Bible says will be understood by the elect of God. 
It is the Adamic election restoration. Deuteronomy chapter 32 forces upon us this conclusion. It says, remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father, and he will show thee, my, thy elders, and they will tell thee. When the Most High, that's the Father, when the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 7 through 9. The number of Israel. After the days when their light, the third part of heaven's stars were dark in pronouncement, they in the last day were specified as the 144,000. Irrefutably and undeniably, therefore, there can be no controversy. Some have speculated that the 144,000 is a blanket statement about all of humanity based upon their characters or whatever theory they've come forward with. But the Bible makes clear distinction by the pronouncement of Moses' quotation of Father that the nations are not inclusive with the number of Israel, for they, the nations, were divided according to the separately anticipated distinct number of another people, the number of Israel, heaven's stars. This we now know without a doubt. Jacob adds to the lesson in Genesis 49. He therein describes the day after the years of divine abandonment of his gloriously rekindled stars, the 144,000. For he pronounces his prophecy as an occurrence for the last day. Need I repeat it again? Our series 47 is entitled Precise Redemption. Therefore, let us be exact. As such, it should be noted that none of the 12 sons, note, I say, Sons, none except one, Dan, is to judge any of the other tribes. Obviously, each tribe judges themselves under David's counsel and wisdom, under his master skill at the quarterback position. Also note that each tribe is fully defined chronologically before the other is described. Now we can resolve the age-old controversy that is really ringing loudly, I don't know if you heard, amongst Davidia, amongst the Adventist world, and all of the Christian world. It can be resolved because we know, as the elect of God, without a doubt, how to define the tribes of the 144,000. I tell you, this controversy is plaguing the Christian community. The confusion that has been engendered by the ill-advised speculators which E.G. White sought to discourage. Reread in Genesis chapter 49, verse 1 to give us the launch point of our clarification. And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Therefore, if you want to know about the 144,000, you need to go all the way back to the first book of the Bible and read Jacob's pronouncement, his inspiration. It says in verse 14, Issachar. You remember, Issachar, he's one of the sons. One of the sons born after Judah. Issachar is a strong ass. Couching down between two burdens. What does he do? He couches down between how many burdens? Two burdens. Now, if you think of how you hauled your heavy loads in the old days, many people in the Arabian world will have their 
camels trained to allow to lay down. Issachar is the strong ass, and he lays down between two burdens. And he saw that rest was good. In other words, he didn't want to get back up. And he saw that rest was good, and the land that it was pleasant, and bowed his shoulder to bear, and became a servant unto tribute, which means if you want me to get up, you got to pay me. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Now, I told you that each tribe is defined in isolation, except for Dan. The Lord hadn't begun to explicitly define for Dan what his plight would be. But he is assigned not to judge his own people, but to judge Issachar's people. Thus, Issachar bears the burden of his own sons and of his sons of Dan. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, an adder in the path that biteth the horse's heels so that his rider shall fall backward. Genesis chapter 49, verse 14 through 17. Dan is compacted and is included under Issachar's double burden. People are arguing now that heaven sought to do the research. How come Dan is not mentioned among the 144,000? Before Dan is described, he is attached to Issachar as his judge. Therefore, his tribe is co-joined with Issachar's. Don't ask me to be precise how many of the 12,000 from Issachar that's listed in Revelation belongs to Dan and how many belong to his own people, Issachar. We have no specification on that question. But Dan does what none of the others do. He judges Issachar. Judah's last day legacy is also enlightening for this study. As we begin to read Genesis chapter 49, verses 8 through 12. Judah, thou art he whom thy brother shall praise. Nobody knows of any of the other tribes they only know of Judah. They are the only ones that have distinguished themselves. There's nobody out there saying that I am the tribe of Zebulon or Asher. Judah, thou art he whom thy brother shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Oh, that means that he's got his hand on the Assyrian's neck. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp from the prey. My son, thou art gone up. He stooped down. He couched as a lion and as an old lion. Who shall rouse him up? Verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. Oh, how does that therefore mesh well with Isaiah chapter 11, which shows a branch who grow out of his roots? It says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet. He dominates Congress. He dominates the Senate. He dominates the judiciary. Dominates the legal field. Behind the scenes in his Masonic lodges, He's got the skinny on all of them. He's got his hand on their neck. Even though they have this divested him from his land. The scepter shall not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet until somebody else comes, until Shiloh come. Now, wait a minute, Jacob. You told us that this is a pronouncement of your 12 sons. Where is the Shiloh? We heard a listing of all of your sons. And now you're violating your own prescript by talking about someone else. He says, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering 
of the people be. Binding his foe unto the vine, and his ass's coat unto the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. He washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. Genesis chapter 49, verses 8 through 11. I tell you, Judah has his hand on the Assyrian's neck. He's got them all falling under his 33 degree steps defined in the Kabbalah, his own document. And they have to pass initiation before they can hope to gain ascendancy in America. Talking about having your hand on your enemy's neck. Through masonry, he controls even the many of the Christian churches. He is a couching lion. What does that mean? He is the purveyor of Paul's described cunning or craftiness and slight that lies in wait to deceive. He is prophetically segmented in his tribe. And this is why we have the distinction vested in Shiloh. Shiloh was not an original part of Jacob's 12 sons. Why then is his name cited with the last day house of Judah? Undeniably, he is an end time, last day Jew, the branch of Jesse through David, the perfect man. He shows a partition of the house of Judah, the Christian and the nominal Jews. He is the righteous star of Judah, the perfect unifier in Christ, the Hebrew quarterback whose mission it is to unify and to gather the people. This manifests that he is the antitypical Jacob, the supplanter, the thief for whom the true disciples are commissioned to watch. But new light demands that we discern the meaning of Shiloh, doing what Adam failed to do, parking his coat and washing his garments in grape juice. To reiterate, Jacob promised of him, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be, binding his foe unto the vine, and his ass, his coat, unto the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. Genesis chapter 49, verses 10 and 11. You already know that wine is merely grape juice. In a good harvest year, grapes were in much abundance. You could not eat them all. And it was impossible yesterday to store them without the chemical reaction of fermentation. Thus, all grape juice eventually turns to intoxicating wine, a beverage intended to bring joy. It has another quality. It is like blood. Once it gets on your garments, it is impossible to remove the stain. I don't care whether you use Oxidol or Cheer or Clorox, etc. Regardless of what the commercials say, you cannot unstain it from your garments. Shiloh does not want to remove it. He washes his garments in the blood of grapes. And more than that, he binds his vehicle that which he uses to carry his burden along his life's journey and as symbol of royalty to a special post. Unlike all others, some strap their burdens to their jobs. Some stress over their fame and honor and the community. Others, it's their wealth, but not so with Shiloh. His foal, his ass's coat is bound to Christ. The choice vine. 
Thus he trusts Christ and Jesus, the root of Jesse. Again, his lone bearer in life is the Lord. For Christ said, I am the vine, and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. John chapter 15, verse 5. Ergo, he is the perfect man. Thus Shiloh, latent to blossom until the last day, formed from the womb over a thousand generations, which means that the Lord orchestrated his development each step along the way. Much of his path of development came through the Egyptian experience, whereby he was inherited female African qualities to the lineage of latency. Not just Canaanite. He was latent, as I state, to blossom in the last day. Thus was he formed from the womb. He is covered by the righteousness of Christ. His garments are stained with the new wine. In other words, he is covered by the testimony of Jesus. Remember Matthew's quote of Christ. He said, He took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Matthew chapter 26, verse 27 through 29. Christ promised to imbibe the new wine today in the mustard seed kingdom, in his Father's kingdom. In so doing, he is promising to preserve them both, such as the stain on Shiloh's garments. For today, he is covered by the wine and the grape juice. Ergo, he's told, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him. And we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. And the words which ye hear are not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you yet, while being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, here goes the grape juice stained clothing. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Christ and Father abide with him. And accordingly, Shiloh brings to the world Adamic election restoration. And with that, I bring the study to a close.